What is it that makes the British seaside sinister? Why does it seem to attract so many killers? Is it the fact that the tide washes away their sins? Is it the fact that it's the end of the line? There's nothing overly frightening about a big wheel or a carousel. But what is undeniable is that the British seaside attracts and has always attracted death and murder. Hello, I'm Geoffrey Wansell. I write about crime, true crime. And in this new series, I want you to join me on a journey to the cliff's edge, where land meets the sea and where life meets death. Whilst some may consider my opinions to be bold, they have been formed after writing bestsellers about real killers for the past 30 years and staring evil in the face. For make no mistake, there is something sinister about our British seaside towns. On the surface, they're all fun fairs, candy floss and breezy promenades. But by digging a little deeper in the sand, we uncover an underworld of misfits and misfeasance, murder and mayhem. And reveal the dark lives of the most deadly coastal killers to ever stalk our shores. Today, we travel to one of the remotest islands off the British coastline. It was home to one of our strangest murders and strangest killers. His name, Jack Campbell. Sanday is one of the most northern islands in the United Kingdom. It's north of the Orkneys. It is a tiny, inhospitable place. Sand dunes, a little agriculture, a place that people go to hide, a place which is not really homely. One man who went there was Jack Campbell. In his 50s, he collected monkeys, which he kept in a giant cage behind his house, Telegraph Cottage. He also kept several of them in the house, because in the end, he was always known to the islanders as Monkey Man Jack. Jack Campbell had found himself love. Well, that might be one word for it, not one that I would choose. He had formed a relationship with a woman called Margaret Johnson, 25 years his junior. She'd worked as a masseuse in Edinburgh, and as an escort, as she called it, politely. Nevertheless, Monkey Man Jack, who could be described as being extremely smelly, very ugly, and she had a child together. Margaret Johnson had met Jack Campbell online, because she knew of his interest in rescuing primates. And she discussed with him her loss of her own pet monkey. She was passionate about monkeys and made the decision to move to Sunday Island to help Jack Campbell with his rescuing of monkeys. And in fact, their relationship developed further and Margaret Johnson gave birth to a daughter father being Jack Campbell. 
Margaret Johnson and Jack Campbell were the most unlikely couple that you would ever put together. Jack Campbell with his massive beard, Margaret Johnson, dark-haired, younger woman. But it was their love for monkeys that put them together. Margaret had a background as a lap dancer, a pole dancer. She was quite an artistic, creative girl, and she had lots of different, different ideas about relationships, but she was very loving in as much as she cared. She was a caring woman and a trusting woman as well. But, of course, like anybody in a relationship, once you move to somewhere where you're isolated and you're on your own, and the focus is on your other partner, unless it's a very strong relationship, you're going to start seeing all the flaws and they're going to be magnified and that's going to cause issues in that relationship unless it's a strong bond. Margaret Johnson first met Monkey Man Jack online. She was looking for a replacement for her favourite marmoset which had died. The marmoset's name was Kiki. Campbell and she struck up this extraordinary relationship based on their mutual love for monkeys. He told her that he wanted to start a rescue sanctuary for monkeys used in laboratory experiments. She believed him. He also told her, incidentally, that he was suffering from kidney cancer and he wanted to be sure that she would be there to look after the monkeys when he died. It was a complete lie, a fabrication. Nevertheless, she didn't leave him when she realised she stuck with him. And she stuck with him for reasons that even now I find all but impossible to understand. Here's this smelly, ugly, partly bald man who would not look out of place in the cage outside his house with the monkeys. She's quite a beautiful woman. She's had her breasts enhanced to a 36D because of her previous career. She is certainly striking. What on earth is she doing with Campbell? And then, all of a sudden, a man from Rotherham, a former steel worker, who's decided to go to Sanday to get away from it all, arrives on the island. His name is Bob Rose. A little younger than Campbell, but still 20 years older than Johnson, he represents a very much more attractive figure. Muscular, tall, really good looking. The sort of man you would see that she might fall for. And also a man who wants to save her from Monkey Man Jack. He was moving there for a quiet life. He'd lost his wife and he was moving away to a little bit of solitude because he wanted to find himself and live out his life as he wanted to live it. And he was seen locally by the, the islanders as somebody who was well respected. He was a professional builder. You know, he was able to actually build properties, he was able to help people, and he did so. A lot, a lot of the farmers and a lot of the other local islanders who had issues with their properties, Bob would gladly go and help out, and for the, the price of a pint of beer sometimes. Bob Rose wanted to start again and move to the island, and quite quickly, Margaret Johnson and Bob Rose started an affair. Margaret Johnson describes her love affair with Bob Rose, a man who made her stomach flutter like butterflies. He was much more passionate, caring and loving. And she described Jack Campbell, a man who was quite basic. She's more interested in him as an animal expert. She then meets Bob Rose and seems to have formed a relationship very quickly with him, which was much more physical, much more enjoyable by her terms than the one with Jack Campbell. Although she's living with Jack Campbell, she's having a sexual relationship with Bob Rose. He eventually finds out about it. We then have the classic triangle where two men are fighting over one woman. Over a period of time, Jack became very boring to Margaret. 
Um, there was nothing in him. He was an older man. He wasn't full of energy like Bob was. He wasn't exciting. Bob was a charming character. He was full of laughs. He was engaging. People liked him, and Margaret liked him. And Jack saw that something was going on. So Jack became jealous. The jealousy started brooding inside him. And now he was becoming more controlling because he realised that there was somebody else on the island. Here is a tragic figure. Jack Campbell, late 50s, hairy, but bald at the top, dirty, scruffy clothes, there's nothing possible to admire about him, except perhaps, just perhaps, his love of monkeys. Perhaps they represented it for him a respite from the world. Perhaps they represented something that he could relate to. But the real honest truth to this terrible story is that they were the hook that brought in Margaret Johnson. He, like a lot of men, can't cope with rejection. So he's rejected by his uh, partner in favour of the younger man. It's classic, absolute classic love triangle. And it's a small, town in a small island where everybody knows everything so he can't even hide from it people will know what's going on he will know that everybody's laughing behind his back jack campbell couldn't stand the fact that margaret johnson had started a relationship with his love rival jack campbell endeavored to denigrate bob rose by saying that he was always had blackened nails, dirty fingernails, was unclean, which Margaret Johnson describes as nothing further from the truth. Bob Rose was nothing like that. It was Jack Campbell who described him as such in order to tarnish his name. At one point, she moves out of the house and goes to live with him. Monkey Man Jack says, if you don't come back at once, I'll kill all the monkeys. She returns. The one thing that Campbell can't control is Margaret's appetite. She wanted in the most carnal manner, Bob Rose. Rose recognises this and at one point even offers to pay Campbell £10,000 to buy all the monkeys, to save them wherever. Campbell refuses. Margaret now doesn't know which way to turn. She's terrified if she leaves Campbell, he's going to kill the monkeys. She knows that if she goes anywhere near Rose, Campbell may threaten her or threaten the monkeys. She is caught. And so she decides, remarkably, to dump them both. She takes her two children from the previous relationship as well as her daughter with Campbell, and she leaves Sandy. Now, Rose's days are numbered because Jack Campbell cannot stand not having the company of Margaret Johnson. Margaret has left Sanday, unable to decide what to do, taking her children and disappearing to the mainland. Bob Rose is heartbroken and texts her to say that he's worried that Jack might be coming for him. 
Margaret Johnson was well aware of the rivalry between Monkey Man Jack and Bob Rose. In fact, on one occasion, Campbell had turned up at Rose's cottage on Sunday with a replica gun and threatened to kill him. Rose had said, go on then, shoot me, which of course he couldn't. And for the first time in this tempestuous love triangle, the police were called. All they did, however, was to confiscate the replica gun. There was never any doubt in anyone's mind that Campbell, this ugly, smelly, belligerent man, wasn't going to take his revenge on Rose because they were the only people now left on Sunday. There had already been threats. When she left the island, distancing herself from both of them, she received a text from Rose which said, Jack and a friend say they're coming to get me. Should I be worried? Typically, in my view, Margaret ignored the text. She didn't reply. The truth of the matter, of course, was that Jack was indeed coming for his love rival and his love rival would pay with his life. Now, Margaret Johnson has gone. The two men are left on this tiny island, population of 550 or so, 24 miles long, and they loathe each other, and they loathe each other with a passion. They've encountered each other on a number of occasions. Campbell says to Rose, I'm gonna get you. Rose says, go on then, do it. If you're gonna kill me, come on, do it. This strange union could only get stranger. Monkey Man Jack is now consumed by a twin obsession with getting Margaret back and taking revenge against Bob Rose. Believing himself to be the victim, he will go to any lengths to achieve his twin aims. One detail in this case is, is enough to tell me everything I need to know psychologically about Jack Campbell. Um, he told Margaret Johnson that uh, he was dying of cancer and, and that uh, the scientists were using him uh, as a human guinea pig uh, to test treatments for that cancer. Now anybody that, when telling a lie, can tell any lie, but anybody that positions themselves as a human guinea pig uh, in something that they are making up, anyone who positions themselves like this clearly has a very strong victim narrative, is very comfortable with presenting themselves as a victim. Their first thought in telling a lie, their first thought in coming up with a deceit is to present themselves in a very strong victim role. When people have a victim narrative, there are no social norms that they buy into. So emotional manipulation uh, is totally legitimate, is the norm, is the way that they operate uh, normally. Um, so, and we see that here with Jack Campbell. He is prepared to say the, the unspeakable. He's prepared to say that he's dying when he's not. Orkney itself is quite remote. In Orkney mainland, there are obviously more people living in, more densely inhabited than the islands. Some of the outer islands are very dark, foreboding places, and they have their own secrets and they have their own codes as well. It's sort of looking at family life, going back to basic traditions when you had lead families and you also had families who were never gonna be further up that pecking order. So there are islanders on, on all the islands who control a lot of what's happening. And there are a lot of secrets and dark secrets on those islands. One evening in the pub, Jack and Bob were at each other's throats, basically. It was comments, it wasn't physical. There was sarcastic comments being made between the two and photographs of Margaret in a compromising situation were shown around the pub. And this angered Jack because Jack now felt as though he'd been utterly and completely betrayed because not only was it 
what he viewed as a friend relationship, it had turned into a personal physical relationship and he felt so outraged by it that he began to devise in his own mind a plot to get rid of the other party, i.e. Bob Rose. Campbell recruits an associate, a drinking companion, Stephen Crummock, 51 years old, because he knows perfectly well that on his own he is not going to be able to kill Rose. Stephen Crummock was an alcoholic who was just stood at the bar or sat at the bar getting drunk and not, not really there for any social purposes other than his own, his own needs. But Jack didn't like the fact that Bob made Margaret laugh. Bob was full of fun, Bob had lots of experiences, and Bob, to him, was the film star that Jack was never ever gonna be. Stephen Crummock and Jack sat and talked in the pub and he plotted that night, instantly, an idea to get rid of Bob Rose, i.e. to go round there directly to Bob's cottage and kill him. And basically what happened was they went into the, the property, Bob was sat there and they brought alcohol with them and said, would you like a drink, Bob, we brought some, some alcohol with us. They sat down and they encouraged him to have a drink and then they attacked him. Rose is obviously furious and begins to fight them both. But what happens eventually is that the two of them are so vicious and so vile that they literally beat him into submission. They beat Rose black and blue. They hit him, they kick him, they destroy him effectively. And in the end, they manage finally to kill him by smothering him. They steal 200 pounds from him, which seems to me to add the worst kind of insult to injury. You've already taken the poor man's life. Why on earth would you steal money from him? But then these are not men of a great deal of morality. Campbell has dispatched his love rival, but he has a big problem. What on earth do you do with the body? He was then transported and put in the back of his Range Rover, which was parked nearby. and transported through the fields across the sand dunes to a remote beach where his body was buried in a very shallow grave um, overlooking the sea. They take so little heed of this man's life and right to life. They wrap him up in a duvet from his own cottage carry him out into the wilderness of an Orkley island and bury him in a shallow grave in the sand dunes. I can't imagine how you could possibly explain that to yourself. Oh, oh, I just buried him in the sand dunes. What an extraordinary, depraved, callous, calculated act. Even though Monkey Man Jack Campbell had lost the love of his life, he had also destroyed his love rival, Bob Rose. He and the local drunk, Stephen Crummock, had smothered and battered Rose to death and buried his body in the sand dunes, one of the many sand dunes that covered the island of Orkney. For a while, nothing 
much happened. The police were mystified. There was no body. Monkey Man and his accomplice had even taken the trouble to drive Rose's car to the port to try to suggest to the police that he'd simply got on the ferry and disappeared off the island and that was the end of the matter. You've got two drunken killers here now who think what they've done is great and they're never going to get caught by the police. They decide what we'll do if somebody's going to notice that Bob's disappeared and he's not on the island anymore, we can take his car to the ferry terminal and we'll leave it parked there so people will think he's got the ferry and he's gone off island. What they hadn't considered was there was no ferries running that day and there hadn't been for 24 hours. So when the vehicle was parked at the ferry terminal, lo and behold, um, people started getting suspicious because there'd been no ferries and thinking, well, why would Bob park it there and walk all the way home? several miles to his home. There's no real purpose for that. So people then started to question, where is he? And he hadn't turned up for his usual chess game at the pub. So people were suddenly starting to notice that he'd gone missing. And it was only when somebody started asking questions and realising nobody's seen Bob for a couple of days that the alarm bell started to ring. And I think a phone call was actually made to the family down in Rotherham to see if he'd gone home or if there'd been any sign of him there before it came to light that he was a missing person. Then, of course, the alarm bells came, well, he might be drunk, he might have walked and fallen into the sea off a cliff or something similar. So initially it was, is it a missing person? Is it an accident? We've got all these things that we need to be looking into before we can even begin to consider murder. Nobody really considered murder at that point in time. <laughs> The national search manager contacted me. He'd become involved in the case um, as a consultant for uh, Police Scotland. Um, he contacted me and told me that um, on the island of Sanday, and it was quite a surprise to me because I'd never heard of it before, um, there was a missing person called Bob Rose, um, and they believe that um, there were two scenarios in that A, he'd left the island, um, or he was still on the island but missing, um, believed to be either injured or um, may have been murdered. I took um, Eddie, who was a, a victim recovery dog. Um, he was trained um, traditionally, um, in the first instance, by um, training him to find um, decomposing piglets. Um, but then we enhanced his training by taking him to um, America where we trained and validated him to find human remains. And I took Morse. Morse was um, a new dog, a new Springer Spaniel that I'd um, acquired from West Midlands Police. Um, and um, uh, I'd trained him um, to find specifically human decomposition through uh, a method where uh, we used absorbent pads on human cadaver um, to absorb the odour and then we'd use those pads to train the dog. People started talking about Bob and the issues with Jack and how strange it was that Bob, who was regarded, as I say, as a very down-to-earth man, he wasn't excitable, he wasn't highly strung, he wasn't the sort who was depressed and was going to go and do something silly. He was the kind of man who would actually front somebody up and try and resolve an issue. So people were starting to think that something's not right here. You know, and there were these threats in the past, there was this relationship issue, there was the photographs and Jack Campbell had been making comments about how he was going to kill him. And Stephen Crummock, who was an alcoholic, was actually getting a little bit loose-tongued as well in the pub saying we'll never see Bob Rose again, nobody ever will. Comments like this were being made, and it was then that somebody decided, right, we need to ring the police here because this isn't a missing person. This isn't somebody who's just gone home, back to Rotherham because they don't like the island. We've been to his house, there's things still in this house, his personal property, that you know, if, if he'd wanted to leave permanently, they took stuff with him. And there was things there that weren't, hadn't been removed, that he hadn't taken with him. So they decided, right, get the police involved because there's a sinister aspect to this. 
Jack Campbell told the rest of the islanders that Bob Rose had decided to leave Sunday Island, but they became suspicious. They weren't happy with Jack Campbell's explanation and, of course, knew that there was bitter rivalry between the two men over Margaret Johnson. So the islanders called in the police. The police came to the island. Initially, it was the uniform officers from Kirkwall and the CID. They came over carried out inquiries and they became suspicious of obviously Stephen Crummock and Jack Campbell and they were concerned that these two weren't your normal sort of islanders or incomers. They were a little bit different and they were a little bit guarded in what they were saying and they didn't want to get involved and it ended up where the police actually had suspicions but they couldn't turn around there and say there's been a murder because there's no evidence of a murder occurring but they knew something was wrong and they knew it wasn't an accident. As time progressed, progressed and the major incident team came up from Glasgow and, and other parts of Scotland and the island was flooded with police officers and they were living in the hotels, guest houses, B&Bs. The island has actually closed ranks and shut down because people began to mistrust their neighbours, they began to mistrust anybody really because nobody really knew the truth and people were concerned thinking what might have happened, might we be involved in this in some accidental way? So people weren't really as open and honest and informative, as informative as they could have been. They were actually there and it was like they were guarded and holding secrets back. With gossip spreading like wildfire and police swarming across the island, it wasn't long before all eyes were on Monkey Man and his accomplice. It's not clear why uh, Jack Campbell took his friend with him to do the deed. Maybe they didn't actually plan to kill him originally and the whole thing just came out and escalated and violence and murder. But it's, it's a strange thing to do to take someone else with you, unless he, he felt that he wasn't physically able to take on the younger man. We know that in, in, when there's two men involved in a murder, eventually one of them will weaken and disclose the information to the authorities. Campbell and Crummock were taken to the police station on the main island of Kirkwall for questioning. Questioned separately, it wasn't long before one of them began singing like a bird. Crummock couldn't really take the pressure. Three weeks after the killing, he cracked. He admitted to the police that he'd been involved in the killing of Rose. It was then purely by accident that may well have been deliberate accident. Conversation in Kirkwell Police Station that Stephen Crummock overheard where Jack Campbell was apparently alleging that Stephen Crummock had done the murder and committed the murder and was the one who'd caused it all to happen. Stephen Crummock heard this and said, I'd like to speak to a police officer, I'd like to speak to a detective. He did and then he said, I can take you to where the body is. Although Stephen Crummock led the police to the general area of the sand dunes in which he and Monkey Man had buried Rose, he was not able to say precisely where it was, and it was a considerable area of uh, coastline. And so the police brought in, quite understandably, a sniffer dog. I was taken to an area on the edge of the beach, but it wasn't um, a straightforward beach. Uh, there were f fields leading up to a sharp escarpment um, of about 10 or 12 feet high. Uh, below that, there were sand dunes and a little vegetation, um, and then the actual beach down to the sea. Started the dog off searching and um, I think because of where we were and the lay of the land, the fields went um, like up a, a small hill, so the dog set off working his way up the field. Um, and when, when he reached a point, it was probably at the highest level of the, the escarpment. Um, he, became in, he obviously became interested in an odour that was coming from below, from the sand dunes. We briefed the team. Um, and then it, it was left to the um, crime scene team to 
um, investigate the ground and recover the body. They found Bob Rose's body in the ground. Um, and interestingly, where the dog indicated was uh, directly above where his head was. Uh, and I believe he got head injuries. Um, so the dog was very accurate as to where the body was. Jack Campbell and Stephen Crummock, who were now arch enemies because neither one of them wanted to admit culpability, they started basically blaming one another. And that was when the whole thing fell apart. Stephen Crummock said he knew where the body was, but he didn't have anything to do with the crime. Jack Campbell distanced himself from Stephen Crummock as Crummock distanced himself from Jack Campbell. When Margaret was interviewed, Margaret started telling the police about her concerns about Jack and the things he'd been saying. She portrayed Stephen Crummock as something of a, a bumbling fool, somebody who was more or less drunk all the time and wasn't really aware of what he was saying or his own actions and just left him um, out of it really. But it was Jack that she really was able to secure evidence against and help the police case. One of the extraordinary things about the relationship between Margaret and Monkey Man Jack was that she had insisted at one point that he never read a newspaper or watch television for fear that he might glimpse a naked woman. While on the other hand, she was sending explicit photographs of herself, topless, to her lover, Rose. Now, that simply, I'm sure, added to Campbell's fury. And perhaps it was with that in mind that when he'd killed Rose, he used Rose's phone to send a text message to Margaret, which read, F off, you Scotch bitch, I've found myself a real woman. What on earth Margaret made of that? Was it designed to terrify her? Was it designed to say, I was no good anyway? It's impossible to say. But what it is, is evidence of Campbell's bizarre personality. When Jack Campbell eventually came to trial in Glasgow in 2010, it was to prove one of the most dramatic, the most extraordinary and the most bizarre trials in recent Scottish history. The details of what went on between Monkey Man, Margaret and Bob Rose were to enthrall the nation and particularly, of course, the inhabitants of Orkney. Astonishingly, when Jack Campbell finally came to court in Glasgow, he pleaded not guilty. But his defence fell apart in front of his eyes when his accomplice Crummock gave evidence. There could be no doubt, even though Crummock was a doubtful character, that Jack Campbell was guilty as sin. And that is exactly what the jury found. They were both found guilty and Jack Campbell was jailed for life and Stephen Crummock was jailed for 10 years for his part and parcel and involvement in the, in the crime and for trying to pervert the course of justice. It's typical of a killer and it's typical of a controlling, not psychopath, but somebody who is a, in a situation where they're desperate, they don't want to lose what they've got. Jack only had Margaret in his life. That was his sole focus. He needed her more than she needed him. So the power and the control he yielded over her was no, knew no boundaries. What he was trying to do was say, you leave me, and all these creatures are gonna be executed. I will kill them all and you'll never see them again and it's your fault. If you stay with me, then we'll be fine. The whole way that Jack Campbell thinks uh, is, a, is, is very much in touch with uh, strategies of emotional manipulation. So he'll be very uh, tuned in to anybody that is um, available to be emotionally manipulated, uh, he'll, he'll be able to pick out, he'll be able to home in on the people like Margaret Johnson who are emotionally manipulable. Um, and equally, he will use, or he will, uh, use every trick in the book, every idea to um, associate himself with 
vulnerability, with, with um, poor um, uh, animals that are in need of care and protection, uh, because that is, in a sense, uh, how part of him sees himself. The one person who mourned Bob Rose was Margaret Johnson, even though she'd left him just as she'd left Jack Campbell. The title Black Bob, which had been bestowed on Rose by Jack Campbell himself, was totally unfair, according to Margaret Johnson. She said, and I quote, if there is a dirty, filthy, unpleasant individual, that man is Jack Campbell, certainly not Bob Rose. The murders that we see from people with this kind of narrative always have a cowardly quality to them, and I think we see that really clearly here. The victim is attacked from behind, not face to face, not looking him in the eye. He's hit over the head from behind. Um, the crime is carried out with an accomplice, again, to dilute um, the responsibility that Jack Campbell feels. Um, but also the actual way in which the, the murder is carried out uh, in terms of smothering. It's such a passive style of killing that almost allows the offender to justify the crime. That, in, in a sense, the victim just stopped breathing of their own accord. It's a way of distancing themselves, of abdicating responsibility, of not actively carrying out a murder. <laughs> For Margaret Johnson, her adventure in the Scottish Isles ended in tragedy and put her at the centre of a murderous love triangle. Her original idea was to go to the island, to work with animals, to enjoy the peace and beauty of the Orkneys. She came to the island because she was fascinated by animals. She was fascinated by his involvement with animals and wanted more to be with the animals than necessarily with Jack Campbell, but took that as part of the, the deal. The saddest thing of all is the fact that Margaret Johnson says she wished she'd never met Bob Rose or Jack Campbell, and she left uh, the island having uh, finished the relationship with both of them. So, in many ways, she, she is equally uh, a victim as was Bob Rose. This case shows how even though the people with this uh, very strong victim narrative uh, typically uh, appear inoffensive, unthreatening, almost sad individuals, that actually having this narrative can be very dangerous indeed because it's a narrative that can be used to justify almost anything. When required, the victim narrative can even be used to justify murder. Looking back, Margaret Johnson said of her now dead former lover, Bob was an energetic, lustful, filled with passion. Jack was more basic. Bob, she went on, gave me butterflies in my stomach. Jack, by comparison, simply gave her monkeys. This story has one final horrifying twist. The monkeys, who were the catalyst to the relationship between Margaret Johnson and Jack Campbell, were to suffer the same fate as Bob Rose. They too lost their lives. They were euthanized when the monkey man was put behind bars. Jeffrey Wansell next time for more Murders by the Sea.